Today we're partaking in the Lord's Supper, or communion as it's commonly called, together as a church family. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11.2, Now I praise you, brethren, that, they, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Now the Bible gives us only two ordinances that we are commanded to keep as Christians living under the new covenant. And the first ordinance that the New Testament commands to the church is water baptism. So all believers are commanded to be baptized immediately after salvation. Now baptism has nothing to do with salvation itself, but it has everything to do with growing in obedience to the word of God and to God himself. Now the second ordinance that we are commanded to keep is the Lord's Supper or the communion. Now baptism, as I mentioned, is done only one time, so it's just one time only after salvation, whereas the Lord's Supper is to be administered periodically throughout a believer's life. And each of these New Testament ordinances contains a wealth of spiritual symbolism. So communion represents the death of Christ through his broken body and his shed blood. Baptism represents his burial and his resurrection. Uh, so in these two ordinances alone, we have the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ inherent within the two ordinances that we're commanded to keep. 1 Corinthians 11.27 says of communion, for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. So again, communion is a representation of Jesus' death. Colossians 2.2 2 says of baptism, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. So within these two ordinances that were commanded as Christians to obey, um, we see the whole gospel contained. We see the death, burial, and resurrection. We see that in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4. This is one of the verses that we use frequently when we go soul winning and preaching the gospel to the lost, which says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And so today I'd like to give you the biblical definition of the word communion and, and see what, you know, where do we get that word from when we talk about the Lord's Supper and also explain why it's important as a church family to take the Lord's Supper together. You know, the Lord's Supper is something that's intended to be taken with your church, uh, not something that's intended to be done individually or at home. Now, there's some exceptions to that because there are people that find themselves outside of the fellowship of the church for whatever reason. You know, there are a lot of dead churches that are out there today. And so, you know, if, if that's the case, I still encourage you to take communion, uh, maybe with your family in that case, but ideally... What the Bible lays out for us is that we're to take communion together in fellowship, in communion with one another and with the Lord. And so that's one thing that we're going to be looking at. Um, we're also going to look at the parallels between the Lord's Supper and the Passover. And I'm going to explain why we as a church have decided to take the Lord's Supper once a year on the Passover. Now, you don't have to be legalistic about that. You know, some churches take it every week, every month, every year, or just whenever they feel like it as the Spirit leads. But I believe there is a biblical basis for taking it on the Passover. So we're going to take a look at that. Now, um, finally, we're going to examine Paul the Apostle's reproof of the Corinthian church and conclude with a brief look at the marriage supper of the Lamb. So it sounds like a lot, but we're going to, sometimes I'll go kind of quick and, and we'll, we'll look at all of this. So... Um, before we begin, it's important to define what the word communion 
uh, means in the Bible. So we use the Bible to define itself, to define Bible words. We do word studies and comp compare word to word and get our interpretation and our definition of doctrine from the Bible itself. So the word communion appears only three times in the King James Bible. The first occurrence of the word communion is in 1 Corinthians 10.16, which says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? And in this verse, we get the term communion. You know, so this is, this is where we get that verse, that term in reference to the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> And this verse speaks of the communion of the body and of the blood of Christ. So we're partaking in the body and the blood of Christ when we take communion together. But what does the word communion actually mean? Well, 2 Corinthians 6.14 is the next time that the word communion appears in the Bible. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? So we see the word communion and fellowship are interchangeable there. You know, so from that, we learn from the King James Bible Dictionary that the word communion actually means fellowship or a deep and intimate fellowship. It's, it's a form of deeper fellowship than, than we would maybe perhaps normally have. But ultimately, they're similar words or they're the same words. So to have communion with someone is to have fellowship with someone in a deep and intimate level. And communion also means to be yoked together, as we see from this, from this passage. 2 Corinthians 13, 14 is the, ne the next time that the word communion appears. And it says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. So fellowship or communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. You know, it's again, it's interchanging that idea of the Holy Ghost. We're communion uh, with the Holy Ghost himself. Now, communion is also a form of the word uh, commune or to communicate. These are all the same root words. And um, in Exodus 25, 22, the Lord says to Moses, and there I will meet with thee and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat. So God would meet with and commune with Moses. Again, he was having a deep, intimate fellowship with Moses from under the, under the mercy seat in the tabernacle. Now, Psalm 4.4 says, Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still, say law. So again, here, communion is applied to communion with yourself, with your own soul, examining yourself. You know, so all of these words are inherent when we talk about the Lord's Supper or communion. <clears throat> and we do this in remembrance of his ultimate sacrifice. Okay, now look again at 1 Corinthians 10, starting at verse 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? But keep reading in verse 17, the very next verse. For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. So this speaks of our unity as believers under the banner of Christ's body and blood. So when we come together, again, it's meant for corporate worship. It's meant for an intimate fellowship with your church family. And when we partake in the Lord's Supper together, we are sharing in or having communion with our Lord's greatest sacrifice. We're putting, we're crucifying our flesh symbolically and coming to the blood and to the body of Christ. And uh, when we do this, we are to do this in a manner that's worthy of the Lord. Paul said in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight, 28, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians 11 in your Bibles. And 
This passage, that's where this passage comes from about examining ourselves when we take the Lord's Supper. And let's examine Paul's reproof of the Corinthian church uh, because there's a great deal of instruction and you know things that we can learn from Paul the Apostle as he actually re rebuked the Corinthian church. So <clears throat> before we get to that, the Corinthian church was a real mess. Okay, so um, we see that throughout the whole chapter, the whole book of the Corinthians. In chapter 1, Paul had to rebuke the Corinthians about divisions and, and denominationalism within the church. You know, the church is not meant to be splintered and divided into various denominations. Paul speaks of one body, one spirit, one calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all in, in other passages. And that's the, the spirit by which we're supposed to take communion in unity of doctrine and in brotherly love and union with, with one another within our church. And so let me just give you a very brief overview of Paul's rebukes to the Corinthians. In chapter 3, Paul calls the Corinthians carnal and spiritual babes. In chapter 4, Paul calls the Corinthians puffed up and says he would rather not come to them with a rod, but in love and meekness. In chapter 5, Paul rebukes them for fornication. In chapter 6, Paul rebukes them for suing one another in secular courts of law among the wicked. In chapter 9, Paul rebukes them for questioning his authority as an apostle. So are you getting the picture? I mean, this was one messed up church, just rebuke after rebuke after rebuke. And all they were really missing was some rock and roll in a youth ministry, you know, and you would have your modern day church, you know, so. <laughs> and then we get to chapter 11, and it's no different. You know, Paul rebukes them again, but this time about the unworthy way in which the Corinthians were partaking in the Lord's Supper. So turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 11, and let's look uh, starting at verse 17. Okay, so verse 17. Now, in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not that ye come together, not for the better, but for the worse. So the first thing that I want you to, to notice is that when the Corinthians gathered to have church together, they were leaving worse off than they were before. You know, and that speaks volumes about a church. You know, when we come together, the purpose is to be to edify one another, to lift one another up, to, to learn the scriptures, to, to learn correct doctrine, and to live better than we were before. So that's the first thing you should look at when you're looking for a church, is are you leaving better off than you were before, or are, is, is that church hurting you? So that's, that's number one. Let's, let's keep reading, verse 18 and 19. First of all, for first of all, when ye come together in, this, in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must, there must also be heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. So Paul again hearkens back to the divisions among the Corinthian church. And here there were probably class divisions as people were bringing different types of food and they were just partaking of their own food instead of sharing as was supposed to be done in the Corinthian church. But it was also this denominational division. You know, maybe one was saying, hey, I like Pastor Paul and I like Pastor Apollos, you know, and they weren't pastors, but you know, that's the idea. You know, we're supposed to put our, our authority into the word of God and not the teachings of men, ultimately. So that's where our final authority lies in the, in the word of God. So let's keep reading verse 20 and through 22. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. Now, Paul was being sarcastic here. He wasn't saying that church is, isn't the place to have communion. Okay, he was saying the way in which you're coming together and partaking of the Lord's Supper is not communion. That's not, that's not what you're doing when you come together. And I, I heard a pastor recently give a really good example of what this passage was saying. So I'd like to share that with you. So if a believer came to you and said, you know, I got baptized last night. 
you might say, you know, great, you know, praise God. And say, yeah, I, I took a shower last night. Well, if he said that, you would say, when, when you take a shower, this is not to get baptized. You know, and so in the same way, Paul was saying, when you come together, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. It was a sarcastic rebuke of the Corinthian church. That's all that Paul was talking about in that verse. And that's historically, that's the interpretation in this passage has, has always been that. Um, so we want to be careful to interpret the word of God correctly. Now, let's, let's go on, verse 23 through 26. For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. So, um, you know, Paul was reiterating what Jesus had done at the, at the Passover earlier and saying to do this in remembrance of him. And again, he was speaking to the church and to his disciples to do this together as a church body. Now, some people look at that verse in verse, 20, in, in verse 25 where it says, do this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. And in verse 26, for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. And some people interpret this as, you know, as often as you want to take the Lord's Supper. And I can see how that can be interpreted that way. I see it as, you know, saying when you take the Lord's Supper. It's, it's the old King James language of saying, when you take the Lord's Supper, do it in remembrance of me. When you really look at the sentence structure and where the commas are placed and where everything lines up in that passage. And again, I don't think this is something that we should be you know, pharisaical about and legalistic about in any way. You know, if you want to take communion every week, that's great, you know, um, as long as you're doing it in a worthy manner. But that's, that's one of the reasons that I also see it uh, being at the Passover, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But look also at verse 27 through 30, and let's, let's finish up this passage in Corinthians. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. So, you know, people were getting sick, some were dying, because they were abusing the Lord's Supper. And, you know, this is when it talks about taking the Lord's Supper in an, in an unworthy manner. It's not saying that, you know, if you're full of sin, you can't now take the Lord's Supper. You know, it's not talking about our individual sinfulness because none of us are worthy of taking the Lord's Supper. You know, um, it's all salvation is just by the blood, like we sang, you know, it's just by nothing but the blood of Jesus. And so those who are sinful, you know, you're in need of it most, you know, to take, to take the Lord's Supper. So um, what it's really talking about is what the Corinthian church was doing. They weren't being somber-minded. They weren't taking it seriously. They were treating it like an ordinary meal. You know, when they were coming together, they were getting drunk off the communion wine. I mean, it was, it was not what, what Paul had intended or what Jesus had, had intended. Um, so, you know, we need to examine ourselves, make sure we're taking it seriously, maybe to reflect upon, you know, certain sins that you, that you have, but that doesn't mean that, you know, you can't take the Lord's Supper, you know, but we can be, you know, sorrowful and, and repentant in, in our hearts. So, finally, you know, the idea of the blood brings us to the connection between the Old Testament ordinance of the Passover and the New, ordinance, New Testament ordinance of the Lord's Supper. 
These two ordinances from the old to the new are eternally connected together. And so why do we take communion on or around the Passover? We take it once a year. It doesn't have to fall exactly on Passover. Passover was Friday and we don't keep track of times and seasons, you know, under the new covenant. Uh, But Jesus took the Passover and the Lord's Supper at at that same time. So we follow Jesus' biblical model and his example. And in fact, these two feasts, the Lord's Supper and the Passover, are the, the Lord's Supper is actually a continuation of the Passover. Or more accurately, it's a fulfillment of the Passover. You know, because it's really the same feast. It's just that the Passover foreshadowed Christ Jesus himself coming and dying and shedding his blood for us. And so it's, it's a fulfillment of the Feast of Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which followed you know, immediately after representing his body and his blood. So Leviticus 23 talks about the various feasts of the Lord, including the Passover. In verse 5, In the fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover, and on the fifteenth day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. So contained within the feast of the Passover are the symbols, are the type, you know, it's, it's a type of Christ, are the symbols of his broken body and his shed blood with unleavened bread representing his broken body. And that's why Shauna was gracious enough to bake us homemade unleavened bread And we're going to partake in that uh, today because really it's not supposed to just be a little, you know, pre-cut cracker, you know, and a quarter ounce of juice. That's not what Jesus intended when he talked about the Lord's Supper. It was a full meal, you know, it was the Passover meal. And we see with the Corinthians, they were having a sort of potluck where they all brought food and they were all partaking together, having the Lord's (coughs) Supper together although they were doing it in the wrong spirit. They had the right structure. They had the right idea initially. And so all of this represents Christ. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So the New Testament makes that clear connection between Jesus being the Passover lamb. And look what Jesus himself had to say in John 6. So let's just go ahead and turn to John 6. The Gospel of John, chapter 6. So Jesus had just, to give you the background, Jesus had just uh, finished speaking to the Jews about the manna in the wilderness, which God had given to their fathers. And this manna was also a type of the body of Christ. And he was saying the manna was temporary, but I'm the, I'm the bread of life. I'm the real thing. And so every everything in the Old Testament represented Jesus. So let's look at... John 6, uh, 48 through 58. He says, I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And like I mentioned last time, the Pharisees have this terrible habit of over-literalizing the word of God in Jesus' words. Okay, so they took Jesus a little bit too literally here, thinking that he's only talking about his own body, but he was really talking about his flesh to eat physically eating his flesh, but he wasn't talking about that. He was talking about his sacrifice on the cross. Verse 53, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up the last day. Notice that Jesus said, hath everlasting life, or hath eternal life. Eternal life begins at the moment of salvation when we believe and it goes on forever. It can't be taken away. It can't be maintained. You can't do anything to earn it. It's, it's forever. 
For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, I live by the Father. So he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. And he, and he goes on to talk about the, the uh, bread of life. In, in verse 58, this is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. So Jesus' blood contains the promise of everlasting life. And that's what this whole communion and the Lord's Supper today is about. Is eternal life. You know, we have, if we're not partaking of the Lord's Supper, we have no eternal life in us. Now, of course, that's a symbol of it. We're not Catholics where they believe in transubstantiation and they believe that that's the literal body and blood of Christ and that you have to keep doing this in order to be saved. They believe you have to keep taking the sacraments as one of the conditions of your salvation. For us, it's a symbol, it's doing it in remembrance, you know. That's, that's the key word there. And Jesus' blood goes all the way back to Leviticus 17.11, which says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. And we see the New Testament parallel passage to this in Hebrews 9.22, and almost all things are by the law purged, with blood and without shedding of blood is no remission. So it really comes down to the blood of Jesus. All the prophets testify of him. Acts 10.43 says the same thing. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. And this goes all the way back to Abel, the first Christian martyr whose blood was shed as a type of Christ. Luke 11.51 says, From the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zecharias, which perished between the altar and the temple, verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. So every martyr blood that was shed represented the blood of Jesus. And the blood atonement is illustrated in Exodus 12, where the Passover is initiated among the Israelites. So let's just very briefly look at Exodus 12. And this is the direct link to the Passover and the Lord's Supper. So Exodus 12, starting at verse 7. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. So, you know, we've talked about the Passover, you know, in our Leviticus series. So we're not going to, I just want to do that one a little bit more briefly. But ultimately, God passes over our sins when he sees the blood of Jesus, which is represented by the Passover. And so there's this deep connection between the Passover and the Lord's Supper. And we see this also with Jesus himself initiating the Lord's Supper at the Passover. Luke 22 Look at Luke 22, starting at verse 15. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I love that, with desire I have desired. There's a double desire there. Um, he even desires the desire. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it. So you see, when he broke that bread, that represented his, his broken body, 
and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. So again, this was an entire meal. It was the Passover meal. It was when Jesus initiated the Lord's Supper. And so that's the reason why, you know, we take a special time once a year and make it very unique and do it when Jesus did it. And we'll have a full meal after, after service today, um, like we normally do anyway, because, you know, in the early church, it says break bread from house to house. You know, that's, that's what the apostles did. It wasn't about going to church and then going home and, you know, and that's it. It's, you're supposed to have deep, intimate fellowship um, with your church body, you know, and that's, that's what we do here. So the marriage supper of the Lamb, that's the final thing that I want to cover today because really the marriage supper of the Lamb is the final continuation of the Lord's Supper. You know, it began with the Passover. It was initiated by, by Jesus' blood, you know, at that same time as he, as he initiated the New Testament in his blood. And the marriage supper of the Lamb is the final culmination of the Lord's Supper with his bride, the church. So look again at Luke 22, starting at verse 15. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. So this is a very peculiar statement. You know, Jesus was going to abstain from this cup and this bread until he would do it again in his kingdom when his kingdom would be fulfilled on the earth. So this was Jesus' last meal on the earth. This, that's why it's called the Last Supper. And he would take it again, though, at the marriage supper of the Lamb. That would be the time when we're all going to meet as a church, and all the believers, you know, we're all going to get together at that last day, and we're all going to partake in the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19, starting at verse 6, and I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready, and to her was granted... <clears throat> that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he said unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Now, I want to look at a parallel passage in the Old Testament. And this is, we're going to close with with the marriage supper of the Lamb today. But if you go back to Isaiah 25, starting at verse 6, you'll see how this all lines up together. Verse 6, <clears throat> Isaiah 25, And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of morrow, of wines in the lee, on the lees well refined. So there's going to be a tremendous feast, you know, fat things. It's speaking of blessing and, you know, maybe the, this, a slaughtered lamb, you know, full of, lamb is kind of a fatty meat, you know, and of the wines on the lees. And verse 7, And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death in victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from, all, from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. Now, if you're familiar with the book of Revelation at all, you see the, the parallels in language between wiping away all tears from their faces, and um, you know it's just the mountain of the Lord is Mount Zion, and so it's all there. And it's almost as if Isaiah 25 could just be read right alongside Revelation 21. 
So these are parallel passages speaking of the mountain of God, Mount Zion, when God will tabernacle with his own people, when he will wipe away the tears from off all their faces, when we will be adorned as a bride for her bridegroom. This is the meal. This is the same meal that Jesus was saying, I'm not going to take of this meal until I take it again anew with you in the kingdom. He was talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, I want to talk about one subject that I I understand is a very sensitive subject within the church. And the question comes up, I feel like we have to discuss it because we have to base all of our doctrines on the word of God. And so we're just going to do so in, in brotherly love here. But the question often comes up whether Jesus was drinking fermented wine and a lot of people will say I'm blasphemous for saying that that he did. You know, I've I've had that, you know, acu- I've had that accusation, it's heresy, it's blasphemy, you know. But the fact is, when you examine Isaiah 25:6, it's very clear. Now, we're going to be having grape juice today because I don't want it to be a stumbling block for anybody, you know, and so it's not worth doing that. You know, 1 Corinthians 8, 13 says, Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to to offend. But it's important, you know, so it's important that we remain united in brotherly love, like Marshall preached about last week on how we're supposed to treat each other as Christians, but also we're to remain steadfast in understanding correct doctrine from the Bible. So look at Isaiah 25, 6 again. This this verse is is the crucial passage which talks about, to answer this question, which talks about a feast of wines on the lees, of wines on the lees well refined, is what we're going to be partaking in at the, at the Last Supper of the Lamb. This is the cup of the vine that Jesus was talking about when he said he would not have it again until his kingdom. Now, when you, once you understand what wines on the lees are, it's the lees that, that open up this passage. When, this is the process of, of making wine. When, when grapes are crushed, there's a natural fermentation process that begins because there's a natural yeast that is on the skin of the grapes. Okay, so God made the grape that way to have that natural yeast. And as soon as you crush those grapes, the yeast begins that fermentation process. As soon as you put it in a cup or in a bottle, it's inevitable that those grapes are going to start to ferment. Now, after the wine is fully fermented, the leaves are the sediments and the dead yeast cells and the particles which are left over from the fermentation process. So it's this sort of gooey stuff, slimy stuff, and all the pulp and the skin and the dead yeast that gathers in, in, the, in the wine itself after it's been fully fermented. And the Bible refers to this as the wines on the lees. So it's unmistakable what this is talking about. It's kind of like kombucha. You know, we've been drinking kombucha lately. For those of you who don't know, it's a, it's, it's a, people love this drink and it's a sort of a fermented, um, and some people hate it. It just depends, you know, but kombucha has about half a percent of alcohol in it because it's fermented. And that fermentation process creates these beneficial probiotics that are really good for the stomach. And that's why people drink kombucha. It's, I don't even know what exactly it's made out of, but it's this fermented stuff. You see the slimy stuff on, in the bottle. Those are the lees when it comes to that fermentation and, and you know, a process. So in the process of refining wine, the lees are filtered and removed. And that's what the Bible is talking about when it says wines on the lees well refined because it's been refined of, those, of that pulp and the dead yeast. And so as Christians whose sole authority lies in the KJV, it's important that we love one another, but that also we put away from us the traditions of the church when it contradicts the word of God. You know, we are going to stand steadfast with the word of God, you know, even on small issues like this. And obviously it was important to Jesus you know, to to put it in the word. And so what it comes down to, though, is that ultimately, like Neil pointed out last week, 
Whether you drink grape juice or wine for communion is not the issue at all. Okay, it doesn't matter. I don't care, you know, what what you want to have as long as you understand that it's the blood of Jesus that it represents, you know, so we're not to judge one another in this, you know, and I, and I talked about, you know, we're going to have grape juice because as a church, you know, I don't know where everybody is on that issue. So we're not going to, you know, cause a stumbling block. But the important thing is not to judge others, you know, when it when it comes to that issue. Um, and so, because what that does is cause divisions, which Paul, which Paul spoke about, especially on these peripheral issues that are not meant to be foundational, um, like once saved, always saved, or you know, salvation by faith alone, and those kind of main issues. These are issues that are meant to be personal convictions. Paul said, "Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind." In Romans 14, starting at verse 20, Paul also said, for meat, destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure. Okay, all things indeed are pure. But it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. So ultimately, the cup of the vine represents the blood of Jesus, and that's it. And that's why, you know, we need to keep all that in mind as we partake today in the Lord's Supper. You know, our fellowship here is too wonderful. It's too sweet, you know, and it's too important. It's too valuable to the work of the gospel, which we preach, to trade in for either wine or grape juice. And so what's important is just to focus on, you know, doing it in a worthy manner, focus on the fact that we're saved by Jesus' blood, and everything we've learned today is that the Lord's Supper is to be done in a spirit of unity and charity and brotherly love. And so let's do this in remembrance of him.